Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dori Taylor, the producer for Remake Learning Days across America. Together with the AIU, who is streaming this series for us through Zoom, and Kidsburg, we are happy to share this September series, So Now What? Helping parents and caregivers navigate a school year like no other. <laughs> Very appropriate. This episode, Learning Resources for Families, is the last in this series. So for those of you who would like to rewatch or share the series, you can find the recordings for each of these episodes at kidsburg.org. Melissa Rayworth, the writer of the so now, so now What articles on Kidsburg, is this evening's moderator. So let me give you a little bit of information on Melissa. Melissa Rayworth is a writer who explores the building blocks of modern life. She's a longtime journalist who's done everything from writing for global news organizations to running the Next Pittsburgh website as its managing editor. She's most interested in capturing what life in the 21st century feels like, how we design our homes, how we parent our kids and pursue those relationships, how we interact with pop culture in our marketing saturated society and how our culture handles issues of social justice and the environment. Melissa has spent much of this year reporting and writing weekly stories for the Tomorrow Campaign about the future of learning. She says it's been a fascinating assignment during the months that she and her husband have shepherded their two teenage sons through the challenges of quarantine and remote learning. Welcome, thank Melissa. Thank you so much, Dory. I really, I've been getting an awful lot out of these seminars. We're all navigating unfamiliar territory and it can be hard to know exactly how to support our kids right now. Mm -hmm. So um, just to kind of give us a sense of what is known about parental involvement in learning, before we meet the presenters, I would love to ask you about some of the research that the re re Make Learning Days team can share about the role of parents in learning. Sure, thank you for asking that. Uh, working with the Global Family Research Project on Remake Learning Days, we learned that children benefit from hands-on learning and they advance even further when their parents and other caregivers engage in learning alongside them. Uh, in fact, family engagement in learning makes students more likely to succeed. And this uh, parental caregiver involvement grows when schools, libraries, museums, out of school time programs, um, and all the places where children learn, reach out to engage with the entire family. Wow, and it, that is really comforting to hear that, you know, the idea that just our being involved and being interested in learning alongside our kids can help them. Um, Tonight, we are going to share a wide range of resources that are going to help all of us do just that. Um, and I'm sure as we go through this tonight, many of you are going to have questions about these different topics. So you're invited to post questions in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll get to as many of them as we can. If we don't get to your question tonight, you can look for more information in the follow up article that we'll be posting in the next couple of days. And we can also reach out to you if there are specific things you need to know more about. Um, if we see a lot of questions that are around a specific topic, we're also looking at possibly creating some more next month because we know there's a lot of questions that people have. So we will keep all of you posted on all of that. Um, now for tonight's session, we have gathered three educators who are going to touch on different aspects of learning. First, we'll hear from Lauren Kubiak, who's a teacher librarian at Butler Middle School, and she's going to share a range of different resources for literacy. Then we're going to hear from Melissa Unger of South Fayette Elementary, um, who's going to speak specifically on working with kids kindergarten through sixth grade. And then last, we're going to hear from Dr. Janine Periton from Baldwin Whitehall School District, who's going to talk with us about supporting students in seventh through twelfth grade. I'm looking forward to that since I have an eighth grader and a twelfth grader in the house. Um, so we have a lot to share tonight. Um, and though we're aiming to wrap up around 7.30, it could be closer to 7.40 once we dive into all of the question and answer. Um, so I am really glad to introduce our first presenter. Lauren Kubiak is the teacher librarian at Butler Middle School in Butler, PA. 
She received her BA from Sarah Lawrence College in 2005 and her Master's of Library and Information Science school certification in 2009. She was the librarian for grades seven, eight until 2014, and she's been the librarian for Butler Middle School for grades five and six ever since then. Ms. Kubiak teaches information literacy, digital citizenship, and she creates a culture of reading in her school. And I think that's something a lot of us would love to hear more about how we can create that kind of culture at home. Um, she also provides tech training for staff at BMS and throughout her district. Lauren, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Melissa, for having me. So um, just to introduce myself a little bit to repeat some of what Melissa said, I am a teacher librarian, um, which is just a term for librarian, and I teach fifth and sixth grade. So different lessons for fifth, different lessons for sixth. Today, I'm going to focus on a combination of resources for traditional literacy, reading, and I'm gonna tie in some for information literacy, understanding what to do with all of the crazy overwhelming content that you and your student will encounter when you're dealing on Online. So I wanted to start talking with creating that culture of reading. I know there was a previous session um, where we had a lot of work with Common Sense Media. You're going to hear me referring to Common Sense Media a lot tonight. They're a wonderful resource. But rather than just sharing them as a general resource, I wanted to highlight some specific articles and topics that they really dive into nicely. So the first thing I want parents to think about is the concept of selecting books with your child. And I really like to draw attention to that word with. I see so much stress sometimes about the type of book that a child is choosing. So I'll pull up my article in just a moment here and I can push it out for you guys to see, but there's a little glimpse of Common Sense Media's article, 10 Tips for Parents on How to Raise a Reader. I want you to think of giving your child total freedom into what they're reading. You can come as the parent with helping guide them on reading level, helping to guide them on content level. I'll talk about both of those things, but we really want to find out what your child likes. So I'm going to go ahead and push out my screen here for a moment. Oh, I'm not able to push my screen out, Melissa. Um, that is a good question um, for uh, <laughs> Dory and the folks who are handling the tech end of this. I know we can share your okay. PowerPoint, which we're seeing now. Um, I don't know if we can switch over from the PowerPoint to your screen. Lauren, you can, you can uh, share your screen now. Sorry. I can. Thank you. Okay. Well, you'll see I've got all kinds of tabs squeezed in the background here, so patience with me. If I have a split screen, are you guys able to see both of my windows or just the window that I have the Zoom meeting in? I'm seeing both. You're seeing both, wonderful. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and switch over then. So Common Sense Media, you can find online on commonsense.org. It has a wealth of information that I'm not even going to begin to touch on. But what I really wanted to dive into with our first section here is books tonight. So this How to Raise a Reader is divided up into about 10 tips, but there's some that I carry over into my school, into my classroom, and I have an 18 month old ultimately into my house as well. So the first one is reading aloud. Reading aloud so often is tied with teeny, teeny, tiny children, and that's a wonderful place for it to start. But it's something that if you find the right material that you and your family are still connected to it, reading aloud can be a wonderful social thing to do together. This could be someone in your home reading aloud, in the car listening to an audiobook together. I have students tell me all the time, oh, when we take road trips, we listen to the Harry Potter books together, or me and my dad love World War II. We're listening to the new Alan Gratz book together on the way to school. There's those little opportunities for socialization, for laying back and listening and just loving a story. And you can always have your child read to you, which gives you wonderful practices there. You'll see they'll give great tips like going for series or genres, finding an author and sticking with them. Some of the ones I really like down here, um, I think sometimes as parents, we worry that with the books that our children are naturally drawn to, we're not pushing them enough. What I mean is sometimes, you know, I have 12 year olds who still wanna read Captain Underpants and Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and of course they do. Those are amazing books that speak to who they are as a person. So some of the best advice I ever got professionally was rather than when it comes to fiction, really encouraging a kid just to read on their academic level, 
have them read on their maturity level and their personality level. So if they think Captain Underpants is the bee's knees and it's the funniest thing in the world, then that's where they need to be developmentally. And they can work in some nonfiction text that's going to be a little bit more demanding. I hear a lot of parent concerns about things like comment of comics and graphic novels too. Uh, they are a huge hit. We, we circulate hundreds of them a day. Even now with our library being closed, we're still delivering to classrooms tons and tons of content. Um, research indicates that it's the quantity of reading that kids are doing rather than the quality. So if you have a young reader, which I feel like almost everybody does, who wants funny books like Wimpy Kid, who wants comics and graphic novels, know that there is guidance in those areas and know that those are things that are really recommended by the experts as well. We want to give so many yeses to our kids to really encourage those reading behaviors. So I'll go ahead and pull my screen back here. Did I not have my screen shared that whole time? Uh, I think you did. I was looking at that. Okay. I'm a, you can tell I'm a Google Meet user and I'm a little bit of a, a newbie with, with going through Zoom. Okay. okay I, did, I, did I did I give back control? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so Wonderful. Two other articles I wanted to share from Common Sense Media, and these are enormous sections of their website, is they have a Best Books for Kids section, which is a list of endless suggestions. Um, you can look for suggested books for children in general. You can get books for preteens, books for teens, books for toddlers. But what I really love is they also divide into more specific area than just age. Age is just one indicator. We have um, social groups recommended for books that are on a particular topic, talking about a particular people, a particular era of history, if that's what your student is interested in. They're really wonderful to navigate and they have great sections. So I'll push my screen out again for a moment here and go ahead. I have their content up here. And again, it, it's, it's enormous. You can see this is part of an overall collection they have for recommending apps, games, websites, et cetera. But if I go through and find one that catches my eye, I like that they had a list that's the best free audiobooks on Audible. I always encourage people to find what's free. But if I open it up, it's pretty extensive. And it's going to give families a list of books. It's going to show you the covers and the titles, obviously. But it's also going to give you a really great range for um, suggestions for age. It'll give you some ratings. It will give you a summary, which might be the thing that you want to go over with your student at home to really hook them in a little bit as well. So I can't recommend this enough. There are some absolutely fantastic lists. But the third send a section of Common Sense Media, I think, is the most powerful for families, guardians, parents, and kids to look at together. And that is the book reviews. Um, as a librarian, I obviously can't read every book before we buy it and put it into circulation. My job is to read professional reviews, which is different than this. These are book reviews designed not for me, but for the public, for families. So as a parent, this is just their top book on the list right now. If I know my kid is thinking about reading all this time, or if I'm wondering, hey, is this something that I suggest, um, should suggest to my son or daughter? If I click on it, I can get a little more information that comes from people working for Common Sense Media, but they also crowdsource and they ask parents and kids for feedback. So according to their source, they're recommending this for ages 12 and up. And that could be for a variety of reasons, reading level, maturity level, content level, et cetera. If you go down a little bit, they highlight some big parent concerns. How does it address violence? What's the educational value? What kind of language is present in it? If you click on it, you can get a little preview of this and maybe see what's common in books and what isn't so common in books. I like down here that there's a nice combination of a summary. And this is what I like down here. Not every book has user reviews present, but I love when I stumble across one that I can see kids have reviewed themselves and they're saying they really love it, they really enjoy it, here's why I enjoyed it. Go through these with your child, look for some things in this what's this story section, you can read it together, see what catches their eyes, but they may not care what the parents have to say. That's something that you wanna look at in the background perhaps. But together, you can look at what kids have to say and really dive into that content and, and let them value the opinions of their peers, even if they're not their face-to-face -face peers. Wow, that's cool. So I can go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Melissa, go ahead. No, that's just that's really, really helpful. <laughs> Great. 
do I, am I, have I pulled back my screen yet or no? Um, so now we're, we're just back to all the, to the presenters and we just need to, okay. there we go. Perfect. Thanks for teaching me as we go through here. So this was that book review section that I had shown as well. So Melissa, if you could click me one pass, perfect, or Dory, I'm sorry. Um, so what I want to talk about is after you get through those, those resources for choosing the actual titles, I, I think that's honestly where you want to do the late work first. I'm going to share a few resources that school or public libraries offer, sometimes both, so that you can get content for free. You're borrowing physical books, perhaps, but even borrowing things for free in an online format. So as far as getting ebooks and audiobooks, audiobooks are my favorite. I have a baby, I have an hour commute and a full-time job. My car is the only time I have to read, and it's my job to recommend books. So I try to read in the car with my ears. So what my school district uses is a platform from Overdrive called Sora. It's soraapp.com. Many, many schools across the country, even from the K to 12 range, participate in this collection. Districts purchase ebooks and audiobooks for their students. And um, sometimes we have multiple copies. Sometimes, more often, we would have one copy per one user at a time. School districts have information for their students if they participate in Sora. Overdrive or a similar, a similar digital platform. They can provide student information on how to sign in. I know that was one of the first lessons I did for families remotely this year was whether you were attending in person or you were attending remotely. Here's how you can borrow content online. I love using Sora. It's such a kid-friendly platform. You earn badges. It tracks your overall reading. In the last year, I have done a total of 14 and a half days straight of reading, and that's just my little commute listening here and there. So one of the things I love about Sora is because it's owned by Overdrive, Overdrive works with public libraries as well. And as a resident of Pennsylvania, in my county, I can get a free public library card, which is cool, because I connect my Sora account with my public library card, and I can borrow their eBooks and audiobooks. I can go online. I have a card for Butler County. I can borrow their eBooks and audiobooks. I went on the internet, and because I live in PA, I got a free e-card from the Philadelphia Free Library, and now I can borrow from their collection. The wonderful thing about that is, let's say your school has a smaller collection or there's a title that's very in demand. I can pull from almost anywhere across the state as long as I find those links online to sign up for an e-card. My Philadelphia and Pittsburgh collections are obviously the largest. They have more money behind them, but they're much more diverse and they have money, like they're much faster to get in demand titles, which is great. So Sora and Overdrive with your school and public libraries are just fantastic. Um, Epic is one that you would need to speak with your child's teacher, but Epic is a fantastic source that I would say any elementary and middle school teacher would likely have in their ELA classroom. So Epic is free, teachers sign up, their kids during the school day sign in with a special code, and you can use unlimited free ebooks and audiobooks. They don't have every book under the sun, but I swear every year their collection gets better and better and better. And there's a few little clicks that as teachers we can do to set up some codes and things so we can push it out to our families and give them free access doing, during the school day, even if their child is remote. So it'll be different from school to school, but ebooks in Sora, ebooks in Epic are just wonderful. I wanted to make a brief note about getting some physical materials. I live in Allegheny County outside of Pittsburgh, so if I want to borrow physical books from my local public library, I took a screenshot of Shaler North Hills Library. They set up a service, and I know many local libraries across the state and country are doing similar things, where you go online to their site or you open their app, you can fill out a profile saying these are my interests and they'll curate and bring you a customized bag of books they think you might like. Or you can do the traditional route and do holds and say, hey, my name's Lauren, I want A, B, and C. And when your books are ready, they have you drive up, they pop them in your car and you head on your way. So it's all safe, it's very controlled, they're very clear on their policies. And many schools are starting to do this as well. This isn't something we're doing at my school at the moment, but it's a conversation for how can we develop a way to support our families who aren't physically in school to check out books, to loan them those materials if that's possible as well. Thanks, Dory. Um, so a big part of my job um, is information literacy. So information literacy is 
how do you teach kids to effectively search the internet? How do we get accurate searches? How do we select accurate uh, resources? How do we give credit to all of those things? So research is a very big process and it's a very ugly, very complicated process that a lot of people don't realize. So two of the resources I wanted to provide are free to residents of Pennsylvania. Schools and libraries, again, purchase these things. So they're referred to commonly as the Power Library databases. The two links that we'll be putting in the chat one is for power teens, I would say roughly seventh grade and up, but there's a little overlap. And then power kids, which I say would go from kindergarten, maybe up to eighth grade, depending on a student's needs and reading level. Both of them come from the Power Library collection. They can be accessed for free from home uh, with either a public library card or there's a link I have here for something just called an e-card. You sign up, they email you a number, and I use it to sign in from my phone, from my laptop, anywhere I need to get to these resources. If I go to Power Teens, I'll bring it up for you real quick here. Power Teens is a collection of databases. And I love the way that they pull these. They put their databases at the bottom, but because this is for secondary, it's going to be broken down into class subjects. You can see I have my ELA content, I have jobs, I have um, things that'll go into current events or social studies. But what I think is a great resource is if you're not able to get a hold of your child's teacher, you have a question, your child needs help with something along the lines of researching, solving a problem, getting some information, you can fill in this chat with a librarian form and it puts you virtually face to face with someone who can help you, help you and your child troubleshoot whatever your academic need is. And I just think that's such a wonderful resource. This is the collection of databases that I teach with my fifth graders and then we use these resources from sixth grade on. If you have a reader at your house, especially a child who loves picture books or nonfiction books, BookFlix and TrueFlix are both wonderful resources from Scholastic. BookFlix animates stories and it puts it with a companion nonfiction book. There's games, there's read aloud components, it's just great. Um, but Gail in Context Elementary is my preferred database. The reason we always as librarians really push databases for research in addition to Googling is this is curated content. It's all fact checked. It's up to date. It is designed to be on your child's reading level. There is a read aloud button there that you can click. It can read to them. If you are a family of English language learners, there are translate buttons. And I think there's a list of about 30 different languages at this point that articles and content can be um, translated into for reference. It's such a wonderful tool. My, my fifth grade curriculum is literally mapped to this resource and really making kids experts in it. And then Dory, can you move me to my next slide there? Thank you. Oh, one of, yes, you got it. <laughs> so I wanted to go ahead and include a little something to touch on digital citizenship. I know many parents are familiar with that term, but if digital citizenship is not something you're familiar with, um, it can take a lot of meaning. So digital citizenship can mean how to keep your information safe online. Digital citizenship can mean how to physically keep yourself safe online, how to prevent social issues like bullying online. It can also come down to things like learning not to spread misinformation or disinformation, or you know, giving credit, following copyright law, shout outs like we do on YouTube. There's so many great things that happen in school usually in curriculum. Google has a free program called Be Internet Awesome. They have a curriculum. It's worked into our middle school library curriculum, touches on all those things I said. Um, but the wonderful thing is what I've linked up here is the family guide. And when you open it up, it has conversation starters, basic tips for families to follow, and their entire curriculum, this whole collection of concepts, is gamified into what's called Google Interland. And it's this big digital world with four different castles, four different islands, and you go in and they answer questions. There's parts where it's very academic and you're really thinking and problem solving. My students love it because every once in a while you get rewarded and it's literally just a game for a few moments. And there's that little incentive for them. I see them playing an internet safety game and thinking, oh, hey, Miss K, let us play games today. Well, technically, yes, but not really. We're also getting to practice those skills that they've been working on for the last few weeks. So I can't, I can't speak highly enough of this resource. The last one I wanted to share with you isn't actually a site, but is something um, 
a Google Chrome extension. So I will share my screen for this last one, just so you can see it in action if it'll allow me to stream it over Zoom. So the extension that I'm using is an add-on for Google Chrome called Read and Write. And we'll be posting the link, you click it, and you sign, you know, you sign into your Google account, you'll choose the button for install it. You can see up here for my work computer, I have all kinds of Chrome extensions installed that do nice things for me in my Google Classroom world. But this right here is read and write. And when I click it, you can see this menu appears. Any website that has true text, meaning it's not a photo, it's not a PDF, I can highlight where I want it to begin and click play. Yeah. It's going to be a little goofy because we're streaming on Zoom, but it does a really great job of highlighting the paragraph in yellow that you're on. And then you can see the bold blue word. It will literally bold the word that it's on reading to you. So your child not only can hear the content, but they can use those ELA skills and practice reading along. Um, we use this with English language learners. We use this with our special ed classes, and I use it in my traditional classes as well because I teach kids of all abilities grouped into the same class. And if there's a reading component for my assignment that day, it really levels the playing field. Plus it gets kids practicing hearing information. That is a standard in Pennsylvania, absorbing content that you're not just reading, but that's presented to you with visual or audio as well is really important. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of this. Yes, thank you so much. Um, well, we, um, we really appreciate um, getting all of those resources um, and I'm glad everything is posted in the in the chat. So if anybody is and we're going to be we'll be making sure that when you all can get all of this information tomorrow and or the day after on kidsburg.org, um, you'll have access to all of these different resources. Um, so thank you, Lauren. Um, our next presenter is Melissa Unger. She is the K through two STEAM teacher at South Fayette Elementary School. She focuses on teaching young learners the early basics of computational thinking and computer science in a maker-centered classroom. She also sponsors after-school coding clubs for upper elementary students and leads professional development sessions on making in the classroom for teachers. Thank you so much for being here with us, Melissa. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to sharing some resources, especially for our younger learners. So one of the big things uh, that when I talk with parents about this online learning and what students are doing right now is how can we help students really jumpstart their learning at home? And I think a big thing is really talking with your child and giving them that opportunity to share what it is that they'd like to learn. I think so often in school and at home, some of our most valuable learning opportunities really come when students have that voice to share their own interests. And so as a parent, after finding out what students' interests really are, then giving them that opportunity to think for themselves about how might they go about finding those answers or figuring out the solution to a problem or researching a topic. So today I'd like to share with you a couple different resources that really help students kind of go down different paths to find their own interests. And I think when you're talking about the K2 crowd or the K5 crowd or kindergarten through sixth grade, really what you're looking for are learning experiences that capture their interest and give them that opportunity to dive in in different ways. So my first two examples are short, quick little introductions to various topics. But when online learning first started in Western Pennsylvania in March, uh, a group of teachers from the region created the Pittsburgh STEAM Station. And this is a YouTube channel. We have about, we have 34 different episodes right now, but each one is designed to give students kindergarten through fifth grade, sixth grade, really the opportunity to do a hands-on quick learning activity that should spark their interest and give them that chance to really research something new. So we have topics related to outer space. We have topics related to the environment, um, topics related more to arts and crafts or engineering and design. Um, and that kind of goes into my second example as well, which is the Maker Monday posts on the Kidsburg website. Again, what I really think the value is for our younger learners is giving them that agency to follow their passions and see what they're interested in. And both of these uh, resources here 
really give students the chance to do something without requiring a lot of time or requiring a lot of specific materials. And they can do it as independently as necessary. So it's something that you could do with your child, each of these activities, or something that they could be doing um, while they're working alongside you at home. Additionally, there's a lot of global type of resources that I really look to when I'm planning activities for students or sharing resources with parents. One of my personal favorites comes from a science museum in San Francisco called the Exploratorium. So many of my students love science, love science experiments, and a lot of these things you think maybe aren't as accessible at home, but when you dive into them, they actually are. So the Exploratorium offers on their website something called Science Snacks. And I love that idea, the snack, just something small um, to kind of get you through before the next meal. And so in the Science Snack area, students can choose from a variety of topics they're interested in. And then as families and parents, you can figure out activities based on resources or materials that you have at home. Another site going off of that is something called Wonderopolis. And Wonderopolis is almost like an encyclo encyclopedia for younger students. So often kids have so many incredible questions that sometimes we're thinking, well, that's a little off the wall or where did that come from? And Wonderopolis really capitalizes on students' creativity and curiosity and gives them that opportunity to type in the question and there's thousands and thousands of different answers and resources. Additionally, Dory, if you go back one slide, there's my other favorite one is called the Global um, Design Squad. And this one is a resource from PBS Kids. But one of the things that I really focus on with my students is how can we use hands-on making? And what can hands-on making really teach us? Um, with the Global Design Squad, this website gives you an opportunity to click on what materials you have access to at home, and then it generates project ideas for you. So sometimes that's kind of a barrier, figuring out, well, what could we make with what we have? And what this will do is show you, if you have these things, this is what you could create, and this is why what you're creating is important. On the next slide, uh, that kind of ties in with what I was just talking about. When you're with your, your child, really focus on, well, what can you create together? And it doesn't necessarily need to be something directly tied to curriculum from in their classroom, but really building on that opportunity to seize time together to be creative and to think about, well, how can we create something that is useful or what could it be used for? And I think students and children really gain a lot of joy and a lot of excitement from having those types of opportunities. One thing that I talk a lot about in my STEAM classroom is this idea of the engineering design process. And so when you're working with your child and you're going through a problem or you're searching for a solution or you're designing something new, this process is a great way to help them think through from start to finish in, in a project. Um, having them brainstorm ideas or plan out what they would like to create, actually creating it and testing it out, and then figuring out how they can improve upon it. I think the real power in making is that students start to make connections to the curriculum in ways that you might not even expect them to. So when they're creating something at home, it might not necessarily be just a craft to them. Suddenly they're starting to see patterns or they're realizing that there's a connection to what they were learning in math or they're bringing a story to life. And that's a really powerful learning experience that kind of happens unplanned and organically. On the next slide, if you go back one slide, yes. This is just a quote that I like to keep in perspective. I think a lot of times with teaching, especially with teaching younger students, um, play being the highest form of research. I think right now uh, there's a lot of concern among parents of what is my child missing out on uh, during this pandemic? And sure, you know, there are things that we're all missing out on, but there's also a lot that I think students are gaining. And having this time at home to explore, to create, to be curious, um, really is helping them to develop skills that they might not otherwise have as much of a chance to do. On my next slide, I saw this online and I think about students every time I see this. 
students as makers, as creators. When we're thinking about what skills they're gaining through having this extra time uh, to learn and explore a little bit in a more unstructured manner, they're gaining skills that we want all of our kids to have. We want them to become curious and persistent. We want them to take risks and be resourceful. Um, and that I think is something as a parent to really keep in perspective too. Um, working with your child, creating with your child, just being there as your child is asking and answering questions um, can really help build those skills. And then finally, I have, I have two slides here just of books that I think are really important um, for students to kind of keep in mind. One, this slide here is just stories that encourage a growth mindset. And we're really talking about, you know, persistence, optimism, resiliency among our students and our children. And these are some books that I think really help to capture that. And my final slide, if you go to the next slide, yes. Uh, the final slide here, again, another thing that we really want all students of all grade levels uh, to be able to do is to problem solve. And so these are a couple other suggestions as well. That's great. We can even um, maybe drop some of these titles in, um, in the chat since we don't have a lot of time to go through them. Thank you so much for all of this. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, we are running a few minutes behind schedule, but it is amazing how much information we are packing into this. So um, Janine, I thank you so much for being here. Our final presenter tonight is Dr. Janine Periton. Janine is the Director of Communication, Innovation, and Advancement for the Baldwin Whitehall School District. Prior to assuming this role, Dr. Periton served as an assistant principal and high school mathematics teacher in the same district where she's been for the past 17 years. Um, thank you so much for being with us tonight, Janine. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so th this evening I was asked to focus on resources for secondary students. And uh, I'd like us all to just stop for a moment and think of the spring as a point of reference. Uh, in one night, our students lost their daily interactions with the teachers who trained them, the coaches who mentored them, the clubs that fulfilled them, and the friends that sustained them through the ordeals of youth. Milestones such as proms, plays, athletic events, and the ritual of commencement were nervously anticipated and in some cases vanished completely or now remain in limbo. So now consider all of this on top of navigating the mental, the physical, and the emotional changes associated with adolescence. Um, now more than ever, it's a tough time to be a teen. But uh, the good news is they are a very resilient bunch. So have no fear. <laughs> Um, on this slide, uh, I have some academic resources for you. Uh, the slides, this, this particular slide has really the most popular resources that uh, I believe are used at the secondary level. Uh, first is Khan Academy, which I'm sure many of you have heard of or used. Uh, it provides personalized content for the K-12 band of learners, uh, including resources from about standardized testing. Um, and its goal right now is to keep everyone learning. So as such, they've created an amazing set of resources um, for distance learning on top of their normal uh, content, which is already fantastic. Code.org provides students with computer science training. Their tagline is, uh, learn computer science, change the world. And I absolutely believe that. Um, students can access lessons uh, about the basic building blocks of coding, and they can build up to courses uh, from actual Ivy League schools, if they'd like. Um, and a few interesting facts about computer science. 67% of all new jobs in the STEM field involve computing, and a CS major can earn 40% more than the average college graduate. Now, if we take that home a little bit further to the Pennsylvania region, currently there are more than 17,000 unfilled computer science and software development jobs in Pennsylvania alone, with an average salary of $85,000. So Melissa, you said you had a few secondary students in your home. This might be an avenue to point them uh, yeah. because it's, it's a fantastic field and we have so many uh, opportunities here in our region. Additionally, another homegrown uh, product, we have Duolingo. Uh, that's a Pittsburgh-based company that uses gamification to help with the acquisition of new languages. So uh, as Melissa said, why not? learn alongside your child, um, pick up a new language or brush up on one that maybe you studied uh, in high school or in college. 
another popular resource uh, are YouTube channels. So Melissa uh, created one with other teachers that she mentioned. Um, however, there are so many other channels that are available, like in this uh, slide, I have links to Crash Course, Heimler's History, uh, the Advanced Placement has a site, uh, as well as a few economic uh, resources that students use for studying for the AP exam. Uh, YouTube is also a treasure trove of videos uh, to help solve common household problems. So I don't know about you, but usually if something happens around the house, the first thing that I do is go to YouTube and uh, I try to watch a video and determine whether or not uh, I'm going to press my luck and try to fix something on my own or not. And I think that's nice for students to, uh, and kids to see is that you're willing to learn something new. Uh, and as Melissa said, learn alongside them and uh, fail forward together always. Uh, and finally on this slide, uh, we have resources from the College Board and AP Classroom. Um, those who teach AP and those who are AP students uh, in high school swear by these sites as uh, truly fantastic resources. Uh, they've, they've really uh, enhanced uh, both of the sites uh, since I was in the classroom. So I, I would certainly recommend checking both of those out. We can go to the next slide. We have um, MOOCs and more. So if you've ever heard that term, uh, it stands for Massive Open Online Courses. So a few examples of that are, are Coursera and edX. And uh, there are a few examples of free online platforms that adults and students alike can use to access content that was once only accessible to students who may have attended an Ivy League school. Uh, the barriers of cost, location, and access are all gone. Um, and it's not all heavy content. You can also learn how to play the guitar uh, using sites like that as well. So there's something for everyone. Everify is a wonderful tool um, that I don't think a lot of people know about, but it provides self-paced digital lessons uh, that can equip your child with skills uh, for life. So modules on character development, mental wellness, financial readiness, and career exploration are just a few of the topics um, that they go over. Um, the FBI, um, you might think that's an odd uh, choice for a resource, but uh, they actually provide fantastic resources for kids to stay safe online uh, for our younger learners, as well as for students in high school um, that might encounter uh, information regarding violent extremism uh, in any video game chat rooms or just in surfing the internet. So great resources there on the FBI site. Um, additionally, uh, as it was mentioned, I was a math teacher. Uh, so usually around uh, dinner time, if my phone would ever ring, uh, I would call up the math hotline. Somebody needed help um, with the, their kids' homework. So uh, there's an app called PhotoMath uh, that can provide parents with uh, assistance in working with their kids on their homework. And Wide Open School is a site that's actually powered by Common Sense Media. And it helps families and educators find trusted resources to enrich and support distance learning. Um, they have over 75 partners and they've really uh, come together to put the best content out there for families. All right, if we could look at the next slide. So like Wide Open School, uh, Digital Promise and Smithsonian Learning Lab both have a library of resources to support families uh, during this time. Um, so many, so many valuable resources on both of those that allow you to truly expand um, any kind of personal interests, passions, um, or if you're just trying to create lessons from scratch, go to both of those websites and we'll certainly help you out. Uh, social media and podcasts. Uh, we, we've talked about this and learning alongside your child. So listening with them too. So with podcasts, Try Radio Lab. Um, that's a wonderful uh, resource uh, that you can listen to, as well as some things on social media. Um, social media sometimes gets a bad rap uh, for some of the content that's out there. But I think uh, what's powerful about it is that we have so many experts available at our fingertips. 
Um, and I found that if you reach out to them, they oftentimes reach back out to you and um, you can model appropriate online behavior uh, for your kids. All right, if we can go to the next slide. So as a parent of a high school age child, you might be thinking about uh, colleges and careers and how might you pay for this? So this slide contains information about um, college loans, um, applications, Raise.me is a pretty neat site where kids can earn um, scholarship funds for accomplishments that they've already uh, achieved in their high school years. And it's just a matter of uh, inputting information onto the website. Additionally, um, PA Career Zone uh, provides outlooks uh, on careers. And as I've mentioned, uh, the career or the computer science um, outlook in our region is pretty fantastic so be sure to check that one out and, and perhaps you're the parent of a student who's interested in playing athletics or sport at the college level so there's the ncaa eligibility center as well as uh, a link for esports so esports is one of the fastest growing sports uh, in the world essentially and kids are playing games on computers. So um, if you're ever, Melissa, you mentioned uh, your child playing a game tonight, right? Well, there, there might be money or scholarship in that because uh, colleges and universities are coming together to create eSport teams. And in 2019, the industry was uh, valued, valued at $1.1 billion with a fan base of over 454 million people. So it is definitely something to keep an eye on. and um, if your kids ever say something about the amount of time that they're, they're spending uh, playing games, know that they're, you might be able to use that uh, for good uh, in the coming years. Um, also, not knowing what the future is going to look like uh, this year, I, we know that large events are probably not going to be uh, on everybody's uh, schedule or availability. So um, there are virtual co college fears fairs that are available. So you can see that uh, on the previous slide. Um, I'm a, a big fan of all things Google, uh, mainly because uh, just about everything that they offer uh, is for free. And uh, the Google Applied Digital Skills allow students and adults to learn skills necessary for today's workplace. So topics and information about job searches, financial literacy, communication, all available on Google site. And I think just kind of as a general uh, frame of reference, let your kids advocate for themselves. Encourage them to make the phone call instead of um, asking you to do that for them. Um, have them send an email to a teacher. Um, create a budget. Uh, contribute to online forums so that they can express their opinion. Um, write a movie review or a concert review. Um, just ask them to create and contribute. Um, personally, I think the most important thing that you can do um, is to help your child understand how they learn best, because we know that over the course of their lifetime, they're going to change jobs so many times, and they'll have to reinvent themselves. So learning how to learn will probably be the most valuable skill that they have. So um, coming into this evening, I spoke to some students, and um, I said to them, how can your parents or caregivers better support you today? So take a moment to think about that, what you think their answer may have been. And it's pretty easy. So their answer was space, time, and patience. Um, they, they, they want you to know that yes, they are under stress, but they'll figure it out and everything will be okay. But just give them a little bit of space, a little bit of time, and please be patient with them. And ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, um, I think uh, teens can be somewhat tight-lipped about their feelings, but based on my conversations with them, they enjoyed this opportunity to slow down and just be at home and be with you. And remember, no matter the age of a child, 
They simply want to know that you are in their corner and that you love them. Thank you so much, Holly. And that's, um, that's encouraging for parents, I think, because just like Dory had mentioned with that research earlier, when we're busy, you know, worrying, oh gosh, we have to figure out every detail about what we're supposed to do right, it's really comforting to know that that in the end, the, the most important thing is just that we're there and we love them and, and we're patient. And I mean, it's it's hard right now. This is a stressful time, but I mean that's something all of us, all of us can give. Um, so it's interesting as we were preparing for tonight all of you had mentioned at different times that this is as difficult as all this is this is a wonderful time for kids to be able to start thinking about what their interests really are and what they want to learn more about and since there are all of these free resources we've talked about it could this potentially be a great school year for for kids to figure out their own interests and and maybe learn beyond what school is teaching them I'd love to hear from some of the, the presenters what, what they think about that and how, how we can encourage that without seeming like we're being too pushy and we're, um, we're not giving them some space. I, I, I do think so. Um, I spoke to about 100 um, students and kind of popped in on their classes virtually, just to ask them a few questions. And they said, I, I enjoyed spending time with my siblings. I enjoyed going outside and going for a walk. I enjoyed reading for pleasure. And it, you know, hearing some of those things kind of made me a little bit sad um, because some of them um, have, have had their lives just scheduled, um, sometimes of their, of their own doing every free moment. So to suddenly have all of this free time, I, they really appreciated the moment to just stop and pause and gather their thoughts instead of wondering what's next. What's the next box that I have to check? Wow. And I agree. I think from an elementary perspective, I know as adults, I think often when we don't have things scheduled in that unproductive time, we, we feel bad about it. But, but I think for so many of our students, without giving them that opportunity to really have nothing on the schedule, they don't have that opportunity to be creative and to sit in their, their playroom and play with Legos. And, you know, just things like that can really spark their interest um, in ways that working on your device or constantly going from one thing to the next might not give them the same opportunity. There's a question um, about, you know, what do you do in this moment when there are kids who seem to be thriving? You know, they found that they're excellent learners virtually from home, cyber school. So, um, you know, I don't know, that's a big question to answer. <laughs> what do you do when there's been an aha moment and success for, let's say, a middle schooler? Um, maybe not so great for your elementary kiddo, but the, this is the sweet spot for the middle schooler. This is great, you know. Um, is it a new way to look at education moving forward? I think it's too soon to tell uh, what all the benefits will be long term, but I know even professionally, my job looks so different this year, but I have learned so many things in one month back at school that I've already said, hey, I kind of got backed into a corner and had to do A, B, and C that I'd never done before, but mm -hmm. there was big takeaways for me as a professional, so I imagine for students, they're definitely, they have to be experiencing the same thing. There's, you know, it's not that all of this is, it's unideal, it's not what we envisioned, but there are some things coming up that we may not have thought of otherwise. And I've really found value and comfort in that, to be honest. True. Um, we had one other question. Um, what, what do you all, what do you worry about most for students as they're navigating this unusual year? I know you've, you've given us parents a lot of resources and talked a lot about what we might keep in mind. Um, for the students that you interact with, um, what, what are the things that you're, you're concerned about and you're kind of keeping an eye on? I think starting at the elementary level, one of the things that I do worry about is just the anxiety level of students. I think the uncertainty is something that even with kindergarten and first graders really does get to them. But I do think too that focus on creativity and moving and figuring out your own path um, really helps to build their resiliency. 
and really helps to give them the tools um, that they need to help articulate what they're looking for or what they need. Well, and I guess like so many of you have pointed out, learning happens everywhere and and having fun and playing, as Einstein said, is, is a big part of how we learn. So making sure there's time for the family to just have fun together and play together, I guess, is, is central to all of this. Well, thank you all so much. We appreciate all these resources. We've um, made all the links available in the chat. And as we've said, if you check out kidsburg.org, you can also um, not only catch up with the past sessions and watch those videos, um, but, but come back and sort of check back in if you need any more of these resources. Thank you all so much.